with a great pleasure that we can now introduce our inspiration points. So talks from uh, from our own Peter Ullen and uh, from the University of Arts Helsinki, Carlo Hilt. And uh, I think we will start off with Peter's presentation and then proceed directly to Carlos. And the Q&A will follow, uh, discussion basically will follow after that. So please, Peter. Uh, it's very nice to see so many of you here and on online as well. Uh, all the systemic stuff that we have been hearing, I have been tutoring a little bit all of these teams and, and it has been a great fun and I'm very proud of all the things that have been done. If we talk about holistic challenges and, and IBEX, if anything, is a holistic challenge. Uh, uh, sort of portfolio of holistic challenges. Well, holistic challenges are very complex uh, things that are connected. Everything is connected to everything, and they cannot be solved with, with very simple analytical solutions. And if we look at these holistic system characteristics, we know that they are interconnected, as we heard from all of these types of cases. They are usually complex. Uh, they need multidisciplinary solutions for them. And whatever you do, they have long-term impact. And it means that there are lots of uh, factors that, that normally you don't include in, in these kind of solutions. For VTT, for instance, the technical solutions is usually the one that we go for, and we say that if technology is good, then everything will be solved. Of course, this is no longer the view in, in VTT, as we see from these IDEX programs. So we have to understand all the other things that are not technology related. Usually, uh, they are very complex. There are very many interactions that make very surprising behavior. There. So we think that this might be the solution, but that, then something else happens, and there's a side effect that completely uh, pulls the rug under us. And we need all kinds of capabilities to solve them. Not just one or two. There are there are maybe tens or hundreds of different things that we have to include. And whatever we do, they they have very long some table. So we can have either analytical or systemic perspective. Uh, we can either see that this is a limited, isolated field, like some. Thing that, that we will see how this new mode, for instance, will work better. And then you don't have to consider anything else but this one topic there. Or they can be systemic and holistic. And the trick is to identify which is which. Because many times we see people trying to solve analytical, uh, apply analytical methods for systemic or holistic challenges, and they usually don't end up well. So when we have analytical systems, then we isolate and focus on the parts. If we have systemic challenges, then the connections and interactions are the key element, not actually the uh, sort of different parts. If we have analytical approach, then we emphasize in details. And with systemic views, we emphasize on the overall vision. Analytical is usually a snapshot in time. We only look at the situation now and that's it. If we have a systemic stuff, then we are interested in behavior in time. What will happen? Causalities of things. An analytical approach gives answers on, on how things are happening inside this limited system. And systemic gives answers to why things are now, I'm not saying one of these is better than the other one, but I use a lot of analytical methods when there's a limited problem, isolated problem, then analytical approach is much better. Then you don't have any disturbance in from elsewhere. But my main geek is systemic problems, so I also go for systemic solutions. But what is needed? We said that this is multidisciplinary. We usually start with systems thinking. But this is understanding the whole picture and interconnected. And then you kind of ask better questions. You understand all kinds of things that are happening then. And we need all these different stakeholders. 
we like to solve future problems. We have to have scenarios and different alternative futures, and, and foresight is important in that. And we heard in many of these IDEX cases that impact assessment is relevant. Whenever we do something, we want to evaluate different impacts and different scenarios of what might happen to all kinds of various stakeholders and, and parties. What is important is societal embedding. So how is the society taking this and how do you guarantee that this will change? How do we change people's attitudes and behavior? And, and this is kind of essential. So if we only do everything theoretically and don't think how to sort of get commitment and, and these kind of things, then we are failing in, in changing the world. We need design thinking, new novel ideas with uh, lots of stakeholders in collaboration. It would be nice to have data. If it's just something mental model, then our mental models are always limited. But usually we have qualitative and quantitative parts, so it would be nice to integrate both of them. We have to put ourselves in, in other people's shoes. So we have to understand value creation, why things are happening and what kind of motives and what kind of drivers there are. If there are hundreds of stakeholders and, and the critical ones, we don't understand why they don't join this idea that benefits me a lot, then we are failing in making this ecosystem run. We need business and legal models, market research, behavioral sciences, leadership and management structures, and I could continue this list a lot. This is not a complete list. But it is kind of things that we need things like IBEX to combine all these different competencies within VTT and outside. So VTT is not the expert on many of these things. If we want to change the world and, and find solutions for them. So critical elements, we, we are very good in technologies. Uh, we have lots of competences and capabilities. We are kind of, if I can say, a little bit arrogant. So we don't always need all these stakeholders. We know better than the rest of the world, which is kind of arrogant for you. And we often say that we are sort of, we represent uh, citizens and we represent companies and, and we represent politicians, but we don't always know what's driving them and what are the actual interests there. So these are kind of critical elements that have to be uh, included. I talked about the integration of quality and quantitative methods or decision making. And normally if we talk about data and quantitative methods, they ask things like, what is the current situation? From IBEX point of view, that doesn't tell a lot. We know that everything is, is bad in, in, in several senses and some things are good. If we use diagnostic analytics, we have data for things which factors have contributed to the current situation. Why is situation what it is now? And now if we are data scientists, this is everything we can do. We can predict a little bit, but things are changing very rapidly. So if we assume that we have historical data and then we know the future based on that, it's, it's not going to. We have very short time horizon, and if we are trying to solve these grand challenges, then we have to have all kinds of alternative scenarios and, and policy there. And even more, if we go for prescriptive analytics, what can be done in order to reach the desired impact? And this is the index question. So normally we have on the right hand side, we have consultants waving their hands. They have very nice methods there. On the left hand side, we have data scientists looking at the big decimal there. We have data. But the gray area in between is sort of combining them in a way that, that we get benefits from both sides. So, foresight and impact assessment a lot on the right hand side, and data analytics on the, on the left hand side. And this is something there are very few, few uh, sort of experts who are both experts on quantitative and qualitative. So, how do we integrate all of them together? Now, this is from Keith Sedwittinen's uh, doctoral thesis. I often use this for impact assessment, which is important. It used to be backward looking, and, and we are going towards future oriented. 
So the impact assessment was easy if you made decisions and then you saw what happened and then you measured the outcome and that's it. Uh, sort of after everything has been done. But we want to evaluate decisions what their impact will be in the future. So that's more difficult. And we are very good at techno-economic impact assessment. But what's about the societal impact assessment? People are very uh, easy with linear. This is a problem, this is a solution, and that's it. We have done everything. Can we? And now impact assessment is going towards systemic impact assessment where everything is affecting everything in our side of things. Usually it used to be goal-oriented. We are aiming for that, but then we want it to be learning oriented. We understand how everything happens. So then we can even have resilience and we can change things that we evaluated before if we understand why it's happening. Well, I said before that everything starts with systems thinking, and this is my main gig, so I like talking about this stuff. So what we have to do and what we have done in, in these IDEX cases, we identified complex cause and effect relationships. If this happens, what will happen after that? If this happens, what will happen after that? We built these models and already we saw in use or use case some of these very complicated maps. If you haven't been building them, they are very strange. But when you are building them, then you understand that if I change this one, this will change. And how do we sim simplify this? And what are the key elements then? And then you can even have arguments. I think this is good. I don't agree with that. And I think you have forgotten this one part. And then you get sort of holistic view from different players. You have to understand short term and long term effects, and usually they are opposite. Every investment now takes all the money away, and then you get the benefits after several years. And we know that road to hell is paved with good intentions, meaning that we aim, we mean well, but we don't understand these side effects, and and they will domino effects, and they will come and kick us afterwards if we if we don't understand what will happen. So short-sighted optimization is a good example. And what we are aiming, and these have been the goal in, in these IDEX, we are trying to find the leverage points. So you can put all your efforts on buffer thing where you push all the money and resources on something and we have nothing to show because there are compensating and balancing and, and all kinds of things. But we would be interested to see what is the small thing that we push a little bit and it will create the reinforcing positive cycle that will create all the benefits without a lot of work and resources. So what are the leverage points of, of changing things? And then analyzing system structure and even simulating some of these things if needed. One thing that we have been using is root model building, because this is a nice way of getting commitment and different views together. There should be a lot of participants from different backgrounds. So then you build these models together so that you have people who are of opposite view. So if you do these kind of things where you want to have all these stakeholders together finding what is the fine way of doing that, you should always get people who are afraid and, and sort of against anything that happens. They are the best critiques there. But if it's only a group of scientists packing themselves on back, then, then you only get one view. So important things in group model building is that you will get uh, very many different aspects of, of things. So it's facilitated process where we, all the participants exchange their perceptions and we try to find answers what exactly is the problem we face, which is something we heard already in, in IDEX cases. How did the problematic situation originate? What might be the underlying forces for that? And how can the problem be tackled? It's kind of collaborative effort. Uh, if it's done correctly, there should be decision makers, technical experts, industries together, finding what are the key elements then. So what is kind of one possible procedure, how we can do these things. So you will start by using systems thinking to map out these various components and relationships within the problem. 
Then we apply foresight and anticipate how the problem and content may evolve over time in different scenarios. So that would be a nice way of seeing what alternative futures there might be. What scenarios do we want to do? We would need impact assessment to evaluate potential consequences of different solutions. All these societal, environmental, economic. So there are very nice uh, sort of structures of finding that you definitely remember to include all of these. Because you, if you only do techno-economic impact assessment, then you get very limited view and, and you don't understand why things don't happen. And the societal view and human aspect that Carlo looked after me are very important and, and we might be neglecting them as well. We ensure societal integrity by designing solutions with human-centered approach. Aligning them with cultural values and ethical considerations and understanding all kinds of things. But we tend not to understand people who are different problems and, and have different backgrounds. So all of that, why things are happening and why are people doing these kind of things and how would they adapt these new ways of consuming and energy and food and many, many others. Now, it would be nice to engage ecosystem stakeholders throughout the process. So meaning that we are not doing it by scientists only. And this has been done. But if there's a small critique in, in IPEX, I would say that we could even do it more. And maybe this is the next year when we have the second year and we have these experiments where we do actual things with the stakeholders. Of things that, uh, even though we do interviews and we do experiments, it would be nice to include all these different stakeholders, sort of a little bit more, so that we get this view of, of why this is politically difficult and why there's learning logic. And is there legislation or regulation that prohibits things that, that we are doing? Of course, we, have, we, we already know many of these things beforehand. But at the same time, it is a good way of getting commitment from leaders and, and decision makers and industries. When they do these kind of things together with us, they are kind of committed. These things we put there are things that they have put there, and they are much more likely to put it forward and, and sort of present these kind of ideas. But what happens if we do a systemic approach? If we do it correctly, it uh, enables more comprehensive understanding of the problem. Seeing the big picture, seeing all these side effects and different things that might happen, we get understanding that if we do this, there are side effects that we didn't think originally. And if the side effects are something that will sort of destroy the, our, our, our nice uh, house of cards we have built, on how, how things will change, then it's, it's nice to know beforehand before we put lots of effort there. If we do solutions that are accepted by broader community, uh, this is essential for, for finding these things and, and succeeding in them. And the dynamic parts, we understand that what happens quickly, what happens slowly, what is kind of passing thing that will disappear. The dynamics of things is, is essential in, in changing the world. And if we do it correctly, then the part that, said, that uh, we said that we have to adapt continuously, we have to have resilience, then uh, this is the way of doing that. So it's not something that we sort of fix at one, one sitting. It is iterative procedure. And when things happen like black swans, like, like uh, COVID or, or Russian attack on Ukraine, then we immediately know how these things will, will happen and what's going on. So we don't just say that we did it once, and that's the solution. I asked permission if I can show some of these maps. Already few reviews showed uh, different steps of that. But I will just very quickly show that, that uh, what I'm exceptionally proud is that all these models contain a lot of things that are not expertise at PPT. So in this one, for instance, we have EU regulation, which is relevant. And it is in, in many places, there's people's behavior, how social norms will change. There's local re uh, regulation, there's public pressure, there's lobby, 
there's posts and there's business models. But all kinds of things that are not technological, actually technological part is small part in them. And by doing these kind of analysis, you can see that, ah, but there has to be a sort of regulation there. And you have to build in the incentives for the companies and you have to make a sort of this known for the great public. How do you change public attitudes in university? And I think this is relevant in understanding why only a technical solution. We only ask, uh, think of a technical solution. It might not succeed. There are so many other things that might hinder things. This is from energy consumption. <laughs> this is kind of early model. <laughs> the previous one, as, as Ada and, and Kathy showed, it has been iterated maybe 10, 15 times. So it looked more professional. This is something we did very quickly. But what is nice in this one as well, is kind of things like heroism and motivation and attitudes and services and, and culture and land use and, and governance by public safety, regulation, economic balance, all kinds of things that normally you don't think in, in technological solutions. And this is food court. Uh, things that, that came from that is, is again, very strong uh, citizen consumer attitude and, and regulation and legislation, for instance, how do you use uh, urine in, in, in food production, which is kind of prohibited by regulation. It is allowed in Japan and, and other places, but how do you change these kind of things that will make the food court happen? And these are kind of things that are, are important in this sense as well. And even there, we found what is environment, what is economy, what is social, cultural, and what is political, legal, parts of that. And what kind of leverage factors we can find from markets and, and local policies. But this kind of finishes my 20 minutes of fame. <laughs> so, and so I can, I can invite Carlo to the stage to continue with human aspects. So thank you. <laughs> Perhaps I'd start with the human aspects um, by noting that we have been sitting for a long while. If you like, I, I, I feel an urge to stretch my legs. You do that as well to feel a bit more awake and comfortable, if you like. Also, there online <laughs> while I prepare my, my presentation. Um, <laughs> Please open it. Okay, um, I might be repeating some some of the things, but perhaps I I come from a different perspective and and hopefully can uh, contribute with something. This is the university I'm representing. Uh, a few words about myself to give you some context of what I'm talking about. So um, I'm going to talk about how we must challenge the existing approaches to innovation and and also about some ideas that might be helpful in the shift towards uh, systemic uh, shift towards sustainability. And my interest in complex systems and change man management uh, stems out of necessity. Uh, for the last 20 years in all the organizations I've been working at, I've been leading, there's always been one or several big change processes and all of them have been connected to um, aiming at a positive impact in, in society. And, and I've had to educate myself on, on systems thinking, uh, complex um, systems, organizational dynamics and change management and so on, while actually practicing it as well. So my perspective is one of a practitioner, educated practitioner, if you will, not a researcher or, or an artist either. Um, currently, my focus is on, on the role of art and uh, artistic thinking in developing more sustainable innovations for one of my focus areas. Um, as we know, and as, as we've heard, um, we've had some fantastic progress over the 200, last 200 years. Um, that has brought us a lot of good, but it cannot continue for very long within the planetary boundaries. So we're clearly heading towards a dead end at accelerating speed also, 
risking the future of not only our species, uh, but many others as well. So we're in a success trap. We fail to think outside the box because the box uh, has given us so much good and we're so dependent on it. We are here depending on it, um, our societies, our institutions, our careers, our lifestyles, everything is connected to uh, that. And to make things worse, um, many of the innovations we call sustainable are perhaps not that sustainable after all. So any improvements that don't really change the direction um, are only sustainable in the sense that they give us some more time. And in innovation reducing the carbon footprint for, let's say, 10% is comparable to giving 10 minutes more time on the Titanic before hitting the iceberg. And if we would imagine ourselves on board of the Titanic, we would surely think that's an improvement. But only if we would use that 10 minutes to change the direction of the ship, that would be transformational for the story. So um, as we've heard already, two narrow boundaries are one of the main challenges in our current innovation systems. When we fix problems for innovations, we've created enormous problems and uh, side effects, as we've heard. And as we've heard also today, we think that systemic innovation is one of the solutions. So um, systemic innovation has been offered as a solution and it can um, be seen in many ways. One, one of the views is that it's a system of complementary innovation. So uh, to really be sustainable and systemic, you have to have a set of uh, innovations in many different areas, creating the shift we are looking at. Another point of view is that you're really trying to change the systemic constraints you're working in. And um, we think this is systemic, but it's actually very divided in sectors. And one of the problems is that um, many of the drivers, uh, stakeholders, um, gatekeepers, investors represent one part of the capital. But we really quite rarely have somebody representing the human capital and saying, um, I've been following uh, the data for the last quarter uh, on uh, uh, the impact on your social media uh, platform on, on, our, on our, our minds, and we're seeing some quite disturbing facts, and I'm not willing to invest people's minds if you're not changing the algorithm in a better direction. You, you don't hear that kind of thing because there's no investor there's no representative. Uh, so there are systemic challenges within this systemic thinking as well. And of course, we have to think systemically. And I think we need all of these perspectives. But to be fair, uh, this idea of a systemic um, approach towards sustainability challenges has been around for at least 50 years. And we're still here. What are we, what are we missing here? Uh, we're still struggling with the same challenges. We have been, it's more widely accepted for sure, but we're the, also the problems have become even bigger than 50 years ago. Let's go back to the uh, notion of two narrow boundaries. This figure shows the relationship between value and boundary judgments proposed by Churchman in 1970, and then elaborated by Ulrich and Migdli. So our values and beliefs set the boundaries, and whether it's a problem we are defining, whether it's an innovation process, and <clears throat> the values and beliefs set the boundaries, and they are social and personal constructs that define the limits of knowledge that is taken as pertinent as an analysis and also who are the stakeholders we include. So how on, how or on what we gain knowledge depends on how boundaries are marked. Um, and this is to say that when thinking of transformative innovations, innovation should also happen on the level of values and beliefs. 
because those are then setting the boundaries. Um, there's an English anthropologist uh, called Gregory Bateson uh, that came with similar con conclusions in the 70s. He identified the purpose or means to an end driven understanding the core problem of the sustainability issues. So purpose controls attention and narrows perception, thus limiting what comes into consciousness and therefore limiting the amount of wisdom that can be generated from that perception. But interestingly, he also noted that um, poetry, painting, dance, music, humor, metaphors, the best of religions, uh, all offer us the possibility of renewed access to the wisdom that what we as a species have gained during millions of years, but that has now become um, overlaid and rendered unavailable to us. So, our values shape our understanding of the system we're dealing with and can inhibit us from accessing new disruptive uh, and transformative ideas. And I'd like to um, test, make a test here. Um, think about books or movies or theatres or whatever art you, if you practice dancing or drawing, drawing whatever is close to you. Have you ever had the experience that um, after reading a book or going to a theater, your perception of something that has happened in the past has changed? You can raise your hand and get a bit of movement. Oh, so many hands. Okay. Have you ever had the possibility to step, feel that you've been able to step in somebody else's shoes after that kind of an artistic experience of some kind? Okay, quite many hands as well. Um, we think to alike. We, we, we should be the more should be more diversity. But anyway, the, the point is that there's a lot of knowledge we're usually leaving out uh, when we're thinking about systems and and how we are uh, can access uh, a deeper understanding of them. Um, both art and science speak, seek to explore, understand, and com communicate something essential, but there's uh, one significant uh, difference. When science, good science, based, is based on an ability to clearly show all the decisions the researcher has done, um, relying on data that is uh, available for anyone, and, and so on. You know all, all, all of this. What what good science stands for? If you would do art with the same standards, you, it would be an artistic fiasco for sure, or at least something uh, not very interesting. And that's because um, artistic thinking is fundamentally holistic. It seeks to draw not only on the cognitive and verifiable knowledge, but also on experiential, sensory emotional, intuitive, embodied and subjective knowledge, questioning our ways of understanding, thinking and experiencing the world, our thoughts of what is right or wrong, beautiful or ugly, wise or stupid, asking us difficult questions about what is meaningful and worth striving for, highlighting the dissonances between our values and our actions. And another fundamental difference is that artistic thinking and artistic um, products, they never try to convey information precisely. The artistic knowledge is hinting, it's suggesting, it's questioning, referring, touching, disturbing, or whatever, um, requiring the person to draw from, from his or her own experience, intuition, imagination and experiential knowledge to fill in the gaps. And that's not a flaw, on the contrary. And I've come back to that. Well, there's somebody else who thought uh, along similar lines. Um, let's say your, your aim is to build a game-changing laboratory with innovative technology, 
um, that would give you make you a clear market leader because both the product, the quality of the products and uh, the quantity would be above anything you've experienced. With the best experts and a clear business plan, you have it. You have it all covered. But it might be slightly more complicated in the end. <laughs> Through their art, playwriters and actors are able to convey the complexity of the human factor, hinting at the reasons for people's irrational behaviors, at tensions and interdependencies between them, the excruciating choices they are forced to make, and the emotional burden of cognitive dissonances bring. Uh, upon them and so on. So the first message here is that this lab project requires a capacity to understand and any similar project um, capacity to understand what drives people, their fears and hopes, their strengths and weak personality traits that perhaps create risks, their values and trustworthiness, cultural factors and so on. It's easy to underestimate the importance of, of the human factor, but very often success depends on it. And the second message is here that the true experts in conveying, exploring this kind of information are artists. Purpose driven thinking can create problems of simplification. Oh, I'll, I'll make it a bit shorter uh, and jump. Uh, into a situation I had uh, a few years ago as as the rector of, of the University of the Arts. There's it's an inst merged institution with three very different cultures, and it's so easy to to sort of think it theoretically and analytically, have the best uh, cases scenarios. So what's a really good organization for for this kind of uh, of a university? At your desk, that sounds really clear and good, but then the reality is something else. And if you're not aware of the reality, the, the, the cultural factors, the different identities, how, we, how what motivates people, what are their fears, you won't have a good organizational model. So I would say Unionist Helsinki doesn't have a theoretically, from a theoretical point, point of view, a very good organizational model efficient one, but it's a great match between what is operationally uh, sort of optimal and culturally acceptable. And that's always changing. And we used an artist to, do, to depict some of the different identities of the organization to have a better understanding, a reference point, uh, a visual reference point for us. And we had a good laugh uh, looking at that. Um, Another example comes from uh, medicine. It's quite strange that in the recent years we've come to the uh, conclusion that perhaps when we're solving one problem, it's not isolated from the rest of the lives of the patient. So the, actually the doctor is facing uh, a system and you have to understand whether this medical situation is actually the core issue, or is it somewhere else in the system that you're not aware of? Is it like the tip of the iceberg? Do I have the correct understanding of what's happening? What is the narrative of the person? Uh, how does the serious illness affect their sense of agency, for example? And that might affect hugely in their um, quality of life. And how do I understand that narrative and how do I connect with it? And Columbia University has been a pioneer in uh, developing this narrative medicine. Um, understand creating uh, methods of connecting to that, to those narratives and using those to help um, doctors to treat their patients more with a bigger impact. And they're using creative writing and um, uh, literature mostly, and and the results are astonishingly good. Two more examples. Um, 
There are two artists, uh, Tula. Okay, now I'm losing my notes. Um, check, but I get the names right. Anyway, um, there's two artists. Uh, one of them is giving us an opportunity to perceive the world uh, with uh, lenses of a different kind of an animal. There, she's working, she's a researcher artist um, here, giving us a, 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 um, a, an ability to see how we see, how we experience depth and pers um, perspective. If the um, distance between our eyes is different, let's say of an ice uh, bear, or an owl, and that changes the perception of, of the environment. The other one is uh, an artist, a uh, pair of artist researchers that have um, uh, created methods of transmitting the electric, uh, electronic signals that mushrooms are communicating, if you want to use that word, and transferring that into audio so that you can be in the forest and actually hear the soundscape of the mushroom mycelia uh, communicating. And that somehow suddenly changes your perception of the forest and gives you an understanding that we have, haven't perhaps understood the ecosystem in the correct way at all. Most of the really fascinating stuff are happening beneath our feet, and that's not uh, something we have used to look at. One last example uh, that is quite famous in Finland of uh, art changing the values. The Hooper swan was close to becoming extinct, extinct uh, in the 1940s, and through his book, uh, he changed how people saw these animal animals uh, and it was suddenly becoming a, a symbol of what is beautiful, what is important for us as things and became the national bird of Finland. And there's a very strong population these days. So um, how are we able to use this kind of information uh, in our innovation processes? I would have something more to say, but I see that we are running out of time. So I'll uh, Include with two slides. So, key messages. Time is up, and I know it. Thanks. <laughs> um, systemic thinking begins with a more holistic view of ourselves. And don't underestimate the human factor if goals and culture are, are at once culture wins. And transformative innovations require transformations also in our societal norms, values, and beliefs because they set the boundaries for the innovation process. And art can be a really powerful tool in reassessing, uh, changing them as well. Transformative findings are not made within the safe confines of our expertise. It takes courage to let go of control and to operate in a mode of not knowing, embracing uncertainty. And that's what you artists do every day. That's the sort of basic mode of operating. Navigating in the unknown requires an attitude of humility, remembering that your own ability to perceive the true complexity of the system is very limited. And there we need these uh, technological and other tools to be able to sense what the mushrooms are, how the mushrooms are communicating, or how a whale's whale is seeing depths or whatever it's, it's about. And it also requires an accommodation of broader range of stakeholders. Using distant and external knowledge, non or metacognitive information that is connected to seeing ourselves more holistically using the information sources we have that are non cognitive. Then another thing that I find very helpful is observation and reflecting on real life situations, because the information is so much more rich there than within our sort of 
um, desk uh, sort of parties. And then art and creativity can have a really an important uh, role in creating the motivation and courage required for transformation. And lastly, we see that there's still a fundamental gap in moving from ambition to execution. And I think we need more places like this uh, to change that. So thank you. Carlo and, and, and Peter. Uh, it's our chance to engage with our speakers. Uh, so comments, questions, dialogue, anything is welcome. Here and also online. So to both of us. Yes. Yeah. Why don't you join me here? I, I will <laughs> go if there are any questions. Go ahead, team. Yeah, thank you very much. Both, both of you very inspiring like uh, presentations and a lot of ideas. I, I'm, I'm still sticking in energy because... Um, we know you. <laughs> <laughs> because energy is something you are not able to touch. And I was really like uh, inspiring about these artistic uh, things, uh, listening to mushrooms and so on. Of course, we... we <laughs> We, we we have earlier like uh, investigated such a, a concept called uh, energy memory. And the energy memories uh, seem to be such a uh, things in, in different cultures that uh, those are really uh, one of the key lock ins in, in uh, changing the, the energy systems and doing uh, transforming from uh, from uh, fossils to wind power or even nuclear and, and so on. And I'm just, we have been thinking that how to really make the value of energy visible for the consumers, for the citizens and so on. And of course we are not able to, because energy is everywhere. I can hear that machine all the time, but then or on the other hand, energy is everywhere. And we don't, in fact, we don't know how much energy we are consuming without measuring, but how, for example, the art could be there to make it visible. So I'm just wondering if that is, is and also that uh, to get rid of those uh, lock-ins, because I know that art is very important also in, in, in that sense, and could be a game changer. But um, there are a lot of things. I know that uh, the international groups are, are doing this, but uh, it could be something to investigate more, and it could be even some technical things to make things more visual for the future. Well, my comment is that we shouldn't stick on just making things visual. Yeah. Uh, there are other means of uh, making information uh, us experience something. Mm. Uh, and we, sh we just have to be creative in finding the way, right way of how can, you have to be really sort of innovative to find a way of experiencing something that we really can't experience, like the mushrooms. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we have to, what what could be the way of making that uh, experiential knowledge that we could all access and change the way we are uh, behaving, and perhaps changing what we think is better for us. Mm. Is it really better or? Mm -hmm. From which perspective yeah. is it better? Yeah. So do those value judgments, how to, to make it them more accessible to everyone? A, a really good question. I don't have a ready answer, but an interesting one. Yeah, Go and ahead. I and I think the, the solution that that in, in food court is made, you make sort of what if scenario of the future mm -hmm. is one way of visualizing. I mean it's kind of between art and and, and technology mm -hmm. yeah. and seeing alternative futures and then according all these experiments. It's it's it seems very, very nice. We will hear results after two weeks' time. <laughs> Go ahead, Amit. Okay, first, thank you for the guidance and, 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 and the speech. Uh, this is coming from the engineering and, and energy. <laughs> so there is the entropy. Yeah. And, and, and the, the problem is that if we want to create a structure somewhere, we are creating a a lot of more destruction somewhere, somewhere else. So in the end of the day, we have no chances to, to make anything that is really sustainable or structured. So 
what is your opinion so that that because it's chaos anyway. Should we trying to make a sense of the chaos? Flow with the chaos or benefit of the chaos? <laughs> I think benefit from the chaos. So if everything is stable and nothing happened, then then progress is different. So if there's any way chaos, understanding that and benefiting from that is, is in my view, right way. I'll go ahead. <laughs> uh, I guess that uh, the, it's really hard for us to comprehend the true uh, complexity of, of that kind of questions. And that's one of the challenges. And I think that, that in some cases, art can be the, the way to uh, express something that is too complex to actually uh, communicate in a very clear way. So again, hinting to some things. Mm -hmm. uh, and it depends on, 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 of course, what you want to achieve, uh, if it's an impact in behavior or whether it's an impact in, in the, the planning process or whatever, but an interesting question. And the entropy is, is really uh, uh, impacting every, uh, in everyone's lives, and, and we recognize that that it requires a huge amount of ener ener energy all the time, and our society has have become so complex, so extremely complex, and we're so bound in, in all the complexity that it's really hard to change. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, and um, bringing the power of creative practice into sustainability transition is very close to my heart, so it's a very complimentary talk. Thank you for that. Um, and I want to a little bit ask about maybe given I, an example and invite you to reflect on the power of this combining these two approaches and how to bring this more power of intuition, wisdom of intuition, complementary with this more data driven, analytical, and systemic approaches. And there, for example, I came across recently this deep sea mining as a topic, right? You know, that's a technological issue in one way. We don't know the long term negative consequences, but there are some developments happening. But it's also a lot about power in the world because there is this international waters that are kind of you no know, rules, and you know, certain power holders are making decisions on behalf of the rest of the world right now. And then there are a group of artists, for example, trying to raise this awareness and the connection of citizens, the normal world citizens with the ocean to raise an alternative voice to the you know other interest parties so when we think about the role of technology here and the future transition we we cannot just wait until it's too late to solve things with the technology but already beforehand while they are merging be an active participants in this power discussion and how can this art and science combination bring help with that well, well, I think that one example you already gave that that when there are parts of in the system, let's say in the ecosystem, for example, that are not so close to us, like the deep seas or some or or the mycelium uh, beneath our feet, it's not something that is easy for us to relate personally. Then we need something that makes that information personally relevant to us. And important and and art is as I, you said uh, one way of doing that but it also has to be based on solid understanding of the system artists there's a saying in our university sometimes when we are self-critical that there's no group that has so many wishes to uh influence a society and has so little understanding of it than the artist <laughs> so so we we, we need to combine with people who really know the problem. And then we have these people who know how that can be made into something experiential, something uh, that is, can be conveyed uh, in, in some form. Yeah, and, and, and many things like, like these artistic approaches, they can be uh, spread much more efficiently nowadays. So all kinds of word of mouth and, and social media and stuff like that, that will get very quick uh, sort of spread all over the world. And once there's a very strong view, then, then companies have to change their policies as well. And I think these sort of evaluations of, of how things spread, how ideas spread, it's something that is not used enough. 
in the, in the sense if you want to change the world. So if you want to change people's attitudes, there's a very, very strong views on, on me too and, and other things where you have where you want to change the world and you understand the media and, and sort of spread and word of mouth models, and then you can use them to, to change the world. Go ahead. Just, just to add one practical uh, example of, of how that could be done, uh, an easy one. We have, as in, I'm sure in many other universities, uh, part where there's a theater department, uh, a really solid uh, methodological knowledge on improvisation theater, which is a very specific specific skill. So uh, I've been amazed several times, even if I know that that methodology uh, of the capacity of, of, of the, these actors, when you give them a context and then you give some uh, drivers and, and see how they are actually making uh, a new reality reality based on that information and how that affects your understanding of it. It's really simple, actually, and it's really fast and it can be truly eye opening. I know that I might run into a, a, an issue of complete oversimplification, but it sounds uh, like some of the examples you gave were very much a, a balance between uh, what the brain has and what the heart has. And I feel like sometimes when we talk about science and art, that that's kind of the realm that we operate in. By engaging with more on the emotional side, we can leverage a lot more a change and a lot more impact. The prime example was this beautiful artistic portrayal of the book that, that mm -hmm. saved the species. Mm -hmm. uh, what what if it were just a scientific report? Would it get the same sort of engagement as 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 as, uh, as this engagement to the hearts to the emotions has when it's in in, in a literary form? So, uh, I would love for us to see. Uh, I'm really excited now to see what what the experiential experience is next week from the future food court. I would love to see that we embrace the arts a lot more in our in our ability to to uh, leverage change uh, and and find a way to use the best of both worlds. Uh, uh, in, in just like uh, you know, I, I have a I have a personal experience with a lot of artists asking me about technologies that they could use to uh, to um, highlight a feeling that they want the the audience to get. So I think that there's a lot that we can we can get from this collaboration in the future. I hope so, at least. And um, I know that we are out of time now. So uh, uh, thank you very much once again, Carlo and Peter. Uh,